Uh. Buddy! Yes! So I have the AMC A-List, and what that is is a subscription service where for nineteen ninety-five a month, it's uh, uh, more money in bigger markets, but I live in the middle of nowhere, Oklahoma. For nineteen ninety-five a month, I get up to three free movies a week. And so from December 2019 to March 2020, I saw a whopping 177 different movie showings in a 66-week period of time. Do the math. I, I, I'm interested to, uh, you know, I've got a four-year-old, and he's, he's doing virtual school at home, and I'm teaching him. And a lot of times I just want to be like, uh, Maxwell's like, I'm having a hard time with this math problem. And I'm like, okay, let me show you how to write it out. Okay, this is how you write it out. Let's get a piece of paper. Let's get a pencil. And we're going to write it out. And we're going to write it out. Fuck it. Use a calculator. <laughs> and the reason why I say that is because when I was a kid, it's like, no, get a piece of paper. Write it out. I need to see your work. It's not like when you grow up. You're all going to have calculators in your pocket. We all do now. So fucking use a calculator. It doesn't yeah. matter. We all have Google in our pants. It's ridiculous. <laughs> so it, it, where did that come from? Oh, yeah, 177 movie showings in a 66-week period of time. Do the math. I don't know. Then the pandemic came around and done messed up my streak. But uh, now movie theaters are back open, uh, for now, and so am I. So it's time once again for some up-to-date movie reviews with Steve Stubbs of the Week! Dun, dun, dun. That was nice. Uh, this week's installment of Steve Stubbs I got, represents I got lost my... in thought for a second because... I was thinking because you have a specific opening for each mm -hmm. of the bits. Yeah. But what if we shot it more like a TV opening? You know? And and just make it like a little TV opening and then we would just play it at the opening at the opening of the bit. That's a really good idea. Maybe this no, week. No, it's just an idea. Let's not give it really good. It's just an yeah. idea. But there it is. That's why my brain was stuck. As it often it's... gets stuck on just weird ass shit for no fucking reason. Yeah. <coughs> Maybe this week. Okay, this is what I'm going to try and do. This week, while I'm going to movies. I'm going to record myself at or around or near the movie theater saying the opening. Yeah. And then I'll edit it together and yeah. see how it looks. And if it looks, if I can make it look decent, I'll shoot it to you and we can have a nice glossy uh, opening. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see for Steve Stubbs. That might work. That might actually work. A man... Or woman on the run. <laughs> yeah. So this week's installment of Steve Stubbs represents and you can my like kind of look around, make sure nobody's watching you before you walk into any particular theater. I'm really thinking Quinn Martin. Oh, I'm thinking more of just uh, like a like a YouTube opener. Hey, I'm Steve. I have the AMC A list. Let me tell you what that is. My life is pretty crazy. That's what I was thinking. My mother met my father, and then they had me. Hi, I'm Steve, and my life is pretty crazy. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> um, this week's installment of Steve Stubbs represents my 26th week back in movie theaters, and in that time I have seen 47 movie showings. I only saw one this week, but I did see the new Matrix movie at home, and I want to talk about it. I try to avoid movie theaters in and around Christmas because everyone and their freaking grandma goes to the movies on the holidays. Yeah. And Amber said, it's like, oh, we were thinking of going to the movies. <coughs> 
are movie theaters open on Christmas Eve? And I'm like, honey, they're open on Christmas Eve. They're open on Christmas Day. They're open on New Year's Eve. They're open on New Year's Day. They're open on Thanksgiving. And everyone goes. But you doesn't have to call me Mr. Johnson. Huh. Like, everyone goes to the movies on the holidays. It's ridiculous. And so I tried to avoid movie theaters this week. I only went to go see one movie. But I did see the new Matrix movie, so we're going to talk about that. This week I saw the following movies. Guillermo del Toro's new film Nightmare Alley. And I didn't see this one in theaters, but we're still going to talk about it. The Matrix Red Erections. First, let's discuss the movie that I did not choose as my movie pick of the week, and that's The Matrix Red Erections. I assumed with the title that the movie would be primarily about dog penises. No! There is not a single red erection in the entire film. No. Uh, uh, false advertising? Much? I think so. Yeah. I and think so. And damned unfair. Yeah. You know... So, when, when discussing the new Matrix film, I want to talk about video games and Tales from the Crypt presents Bordello of Blood. Okay. There's something... So, there's this thing that happens in video games um, where... A character will, one character will say the mission, like, this is what you gotta do. You gotta tail Moretti. Make sure you're not seen. Follow him to the rendezvous point. And while, once you see where they're, where they're planning, sneak your way in there, find out what happens, and come back to this, come back to our hideaway and report to me. Got it? And then the character you're playing, it's like, I've got it, but gee, this sounds like a bad video game. And then, yeah. and then you, playing the game, go, ah, ha, ha, hearty laugh. And uh, this happens, uh, they'll put this in a video game so that hopefully they'll be absolved for being a bad video game. Yeah. The first time I saw it was True Crime Streets of L.A. Streets of New York? True Crime Streets of New York. It's like, wow, this all sounds like a level in a bad video game. And then yes. it, it, it does happen more than you would realize. It sometimes happens in movies, too. It was a joke in Top Gun. I understand. I'm not the first musician to fall in love with a girl, only to realize that yes. she... Is a part of the French Resistance, who, and then all of that. It all sounds like some bad movie, and then they look at the camera. But it, it, the, the main uh, time that I've ever heard that in a film was Tales from the Crypt presents Bordello of Blood with Dennis Miller, uh, one of the worst Dennis's. Yes. Dennis Leary is, is the best. Hell, Dennis Franz. On a scale from Dennis Leary to Dennis Miller. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I just automatically want to say Leary, but no, it's Dennis it's Miller. And the thing is, is that I remember as a young kid wanting, staying up and in order to watch Weekend Update, because I thought that Dennis Miller was like the coolest fucking guy on the planet, and he yeah. was always sticking it to the president and sticking it to Republicans. And then he had a, a, a talk show on HBO uh, and where he would, I'd hate to go on a rant, and he would go on this monologue against like politics and all of that. And, and now he's, that he's older, he's like a far-right Fox News talking head type guy. And it's like, what happened to cool, young fucking Dennis Miller? Yeah. It's like, he, fuck. The, he's that one sucks. of them who, who got the living shit scared out of him over 9-11. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's fucked up is what it is. So it, went, so in it that, all went out the window so that he can handle his fear. Yeah. I mean, let's it, face facts. Republicans are all fucking fear-based. Everything yes. about them is yes. what they're fucking afraid of. Yeah. You know, 
Oh, agree. but this is Steve's yeah. movie stubs. Let's save that. We can revisit yeah. that. <laughs> okay. Oh, so, yeah, he says that, like, they're going through a warehouse, and it's dark. And they've got flashlights, and it's like, wow, this looks like a scene in a really bad movie. Uh, with that, with all of that in mind, The Matrix Resurrection is the most meta fucking film in the world. It starts off with, oh Jesus, wow, uh, loud noise alert. It's the opening scene. It features different actors. Acting out, line for line, shot for shot, scene for scene, the opening of the first Matrix film. Yeah. So it's the first Matrix film again. And then as the actual film opens up, uh, you see Neo, but he's back in the Matrix, and he's Thomas Anderson, and he's a video game designer, and he's world-famous for having designed these three popular games called The Matrix, and you see footage from the video games, and it's just the movies. And it, and in, in the movie, in the movie, The Matrix Resurrections, Thomas Anderson, the creator of The Matrix series, is being pressured to make a new Matrix and there's all this debate about, oh, maybe we shouldn't make a new Matrix. Uh, sequels are just retreads of the originals, and that's what this is. And there's okay, so many... wait, wait, wait. So he it's, is... He, it's they're the trying to get him shit. to make a, a new Matrix, not a new Matrix game. They're trying to make a new Matrix like they live in in the previous movies? No, they're trying to get him to make a new Matrix video game. Oh, okay. But while they're talking about this new Matrix video game, they're like, I don't know. Sequels are pretty derivative. Nowadays, it's just a bunch of fan service. People want to see the same thing over and over again. Maybe we shouldn't do that. Oh, but maybe we should. Maybe we need to give the fans what they want. And it's too meta. And it's, it's the exact same thing as Dennis Miller saying... Oh, this sounds like a scene from a bad movie in Tales from the Crypt Presents Bordello of Blood. I think I might be the only critic who will tie the new Matrix film to Tales from the Crypt Presents Bordello of Blood, but it feels like the Matrix is going fucking hardcore on meta in order to become critic-proof to critics saying this is uh, uh, just a rehash of the original. You know? Okay. It's like if The Force Awakens in that movie, Luke Skywalker becomes so famous that they make a movie called Star Wars. Yeah. And in The Force Awakens, they're like, huh, maybe we should make another Star Wars film here in space. I don't know. A lot of people nowadays just want to see the same shit. And, and I just feel that this Matrix movie is... Uh, nowadays, sequels are just fan service. And I'd hate to go back to the Ghostbusters, yeah. but like uh, uh, Paul Feig was like, hey, we're making a Ghostbusters film, but... We're not just going to give the fans what they want. We're going to do something fresh and new and original. And audiences, cough, cough, uh, uh, toxic white males, cough, cough, all the fanboys said, we don't want anything new. We just want the same old shit. <laughs> and so Dan Aykroyd and uh, what's his nuts, uh, <coughs> the guy who directed the first one's like, don't worry, fans, we'll give you what you want. The same old shit. Yeah. And that's just the standard for reboots now. It's, it's just fan service the movie. Bill and Ted, fan service the movie. The Force Awakens, fan yeah. service the movie. Ghostbusters, fan service the movie. Matrix Resurrections, fan service the movie. And so and, that's... And, and especially with Bill and Ted, man, I really, really... I, I, I thought... 
with as huge of a gap in time we have, that gives you the opportunity to do something completely unique with yeah. the idea. And, yeah, no, they didn't. They made another Bill and Ted movie. Except they're old now. Yeah. The thing that upsets me about the new Bill and Ted, and I've said this a bunch of times, and I'll keep saying it over and over again, the two actresses who played the princesses in the first two Bill and Ted movies are still alive, and they're gorgeous, but they were not cast as, their, as Bill and Ted's wives in this film because those women actually aged gracefully and don't look like Bill and Ted do because they have had uh, uh, work done. Yes. And they don't look their age. And so they couldn't hire the women who actually look the way that Keanu Reeves should look. Yeah. And it pisses me off. Diane Franklin is a gorgeous actress. She was uh, the, the foreign exchange student in Better Off Dead, which is one of my favorite movies. Yes. And I follow her on Instagram and Twitter, and she's still goddamn gorgeous. And the fact that they didn't put her in this film... And the other one, the friggin' redhead, whatever, is just upsetting. It's upsetting to me. Yes. And they brought George Carlin back to life as like a hologram, whatever the fuck, in the new Bill and Ted. The same way that they brought Harold Ramis back from the dead. Yeah. Which pisses me off. But Ghostbusters was fun. I don't know. The Matrix was... Hey, I saw it. That was fun. Well, I'm sorry. The, the Matrix broke it with the second one for me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, first... I mean, like... Like... Okay, the second Matrix movie is The Empire Strikes Back. Okay? It, the whole movie is setting you up for that third movie. Yep. And it's setting you up with really kind of like a lot of interesting ideas. You know? Like, yeah. I love and hate The Matrix 2. Okay? Yeah. I love what... I love how deep they were, they were taking it. The whole idea of The Matrix and how it's constructed and all that. And how this anomaly, blah, blah, blah. Okay? I loved it. But then, it's like if Return of the Jedi was a pencil sketch. Yeah. You know? Like, like, oh my god, Han is still caught in carbonite. Let's see the, see the third movie. And it's just like a drawing. Wah, wah, wah. That somebody took off of their refrigerator. And that's yeah. Jedi 3. That's Return of the Jedi. And that's Matrix 3. That's exactly... Matrix 3 was nothing much more than a big-ass action movie. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. okay, so what happened to all of this that you were talking about over here in this other movie that now sucks because you didn't pay any of it off? Yeah. You know? Yeah. The Merovingian was in the new Matrix movie, and it's like, I vaguely remember you. I saw the second Matrix movie like two or three times. I just remember you as being like a hoity toity douchebag that dragged the movie down. I don't remember you as being an important, integral part of the Matrix universe, but whatever. But I was I, right. But the idea of the Matrix just now being a video game and nothing else created by game designer Thomas Anderson, that could, no, be, but then, in, no, that but, could be intriguing, you know? No, but, that's, but then you learn that that's what the, ma the new Matrix gave him, and now he just thinks that he's crazy. No, I just but, want. No, I just want to see game designer Tom Anderson go home to his wife Trinity and his two kids and their big fucking disappointments and he just broke up with his side lady, you know? Yeah. And like, I, I, I'm 
just going to sit back, have a six-pack, and watch the fucking game now. Yeah. And that's I, the Matrix. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of rehashing and just, eh. It's, it, it's, it's fine, but it definitely seems like the Matrix 4 and not the Matrix 1. I mean, if basically that makes I'm sense. saying, take, take Thomas Anderson from the first movie. Had he never taken the blue pill or the red pill, whichever the fuck one. No, it felt like an explosion or an earthquake. Did you feel that? I have no idea what that was. It was either it was either an earthquake that I felt in the middle of funny talking or some building exploded. What happened? I don't know. You were talking and then suddenly out out like I felt the earth rumbling and what sounded like a freaking explosion. Out, far outside somewhere. It, I don't, you probably can't pick it up while watching, but it was fucking something. Okay. There's no like cloud outside somewhere or anything. So in about two minutes, maybe let's see if we hear sirens. Yeah, because that was something. Yeah, I'm everything. Everything was kind of Jesus. I was like it was like a rumble out here. Yeah, yeah, I felt it. I, I felt the ground. Oh, and it must have been closer to this side because all I heard was sounded like somebody dropped something against the wall. Like, oh no, nothing. I felt it down here, and I can hear it out there. Oh no shit! But he's right. Let's wait and see. If we hear yeah. Sirens. Fuck. I was right about uh, Neil Patrick Harris's character. I don't want to say what, but I will say this. My dad used to have this book, and it was like the big book of rules of thumb. And they interviewed all of these professionals in different fields. And they asked him, they asked, and the, the author, the compiler, just said, what are rules of thumb for your business? And I used to flip through it all the time as a kid. And, and like there was a, a person who worked at theme parks, and he said, when you go into a theme park, uh, human beings are, are, are like subconsciously trained to... I am entering, I will walk on the right side, just like traffic, yes. and that side gets congested. So if you want to go through the park a little bit quicker, walk on the left side once you enter a theme park. There will be people walking uh, uh, towards you, but they will part when they see you, which will make it quicker to walk, not right now, than by walking on the right side with everyone else. And one, like a act, like either a screenwriter or a playwright said in a mystery it's always the best actor who did it <laughs> and i'm like okay here are all these people in this movie ooh neil patrick harris plays a psychiatrist <coughs> i have a theory as to who he is and my theory was right so yay i was happy about that okay cool. so that's the ma so that's the matrix red erection uh, yeah, I'm eh, in a hurry. Yeah, it's fine. I'm glad. I'm glad I saw it at home and not in a theater because I could like watch 45 minutes and then pause it, go get myself a drink, go to the bathroom, complain about it to my wife, and then go back and see it some more. You know, so I was happy about that. If I had seen it in a theater, I would have been like, oh, fucking yeah. So that was the Matrix Red Erection. It's as fine. And finally, the Steve. Okay, but now, now, have you revisited the original Matrix? I saw it in theaters like I, two. Because now I am hearing, and it makes perfect sense to me. But I never thought of it, and it obviously must be going straight over my head. All the transgender references in the original Matrix movie. Yes, and that's why I feel bad about saying shit about this new Matrix movie because the first Matrix film really is a trans analogy and I see that and I love the first Matrix film and I really like it. I, and I do identify now as a woman and a trans woman and a trans woman of color and as a trans person, 
I, it, it's difficult for me to say this, but the new Matrix movie, eh, it's fine, but I, I'm not going to hail it as a trans masterpiece. I mean, the first film is amazing and uh, historic and uh, genre defining, and it, it's an amazing movie. The second one, less so. The third one, even less so. The fourth one, eh. But the, eh, yeah. The first one, I can see all of the trans analogies, and I respect that. Well, well, I'm saying but, they, they completely go over my head. I don't see them, although, although hearing, that, hearing that they're there is kind of like, well, duh. I mean, they must be. There are things. There I'm are not seeing them. There are trans things in that film that I in that first Matrix film that I understand and that I see and that I relate to. Like, hey, I now realize who I am, and I am Neo, and I have changed who I am. But there's still that son of a bitch that's like Mr. Anderson, and I'm like. Fucking, don't dead name me. My name is Neo, bitch. That is so fucking interesting, because I just, I just never thought of it that way. Yeah, yeah. There, there's cool. definitely some trans shit in the Matrix film. Yeah. Yeah. And also... And, and see, and, that was, and that's why I wanted to bring it up, because it's kind of been bothering me, because, like, it makes total perfect sense that the transgender people who made this movie <laughs> may have yeah. transgender references in it, you know? And realizing, but, realizing you're trans and changing your life and changing who you are is a lot like you live in this comfortable, nice, fake world that you feel trapped in, and suddenly you're in pink goo and you don't know how to walk. You don't know what food is. And you don't know who you are. And it's a, a slow, long process to getting to be who you really are. Yeah. So, so yeah, there, there's a lot of trans stuff in that first Matrix film. The second Matrix film is just uh, orgies in a cave. Yeah. And fighting on a freeway. But the first film, there's a lot of that shit. And I see that now. And I noticed that two weeks ago when I saw the first Matrix again in theaters. I'm like, okay, there's this. Okay, there's that. All right, there you go. I understand that. I'm, I'm going to have to give it another look with that in mind now. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, it's a, it's, the, the first one was, was an absolutely amazing movie. And yeah. completely oh. breakthrough. And yeah. very fresh. Yeah. You know, but it's it's also like one of those ideas like it floats around for a while and it's just kind of out there in the zeitgeist, that sort of idea, like then a movie like The Matrix does it, you know? Yeah. And shows you what you've always kind of thought anyway. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, it's always been kind of an idea that reality is not reality. Yeah. In one way or the other. But it's really rarely been done. Yeah. You know, so like, The Matrix winds up being like really new and kind of old at the same time. I thought of this, our Christmas tradition is to watch Guardians of the Galaxy. And nice. Guardians of the Galaxy 2. So when they are actually having war through video games, that's not, like, like why have we not seen this a whole lot more in movies? Yeah. But this is basically the first time that we've actually seen it. Yeah, but also... Last Star yeah. Fight the Fighter does not count. Yeah, it's, it's a new idea Am for me. Am I too movies. high? Am I just rambling? Am I making any kind of it, sense? You are pretty high, but um, it, it's a new... The Matrix was a new idea for movies, 
but also it wasn't that new. Because I feel that a lot of The Matrix hadn't been seen in, in cinemas, but also I feel that a lot of The Matrix was, I've got a great original idea for a movie. What if David Icke was right? Yeah. So I, I, I feel that, that the, a lot of The Matrix was just that. Well, you know? no, because let's face facts, David Icke stole it from the fucking Matrix. <laughs> well, well, I, it's some, some of that shit predates the Matrix film. Yeah. Some of it, but anyway. Yeah, you, you really should rewatch the Matrix uh, with uh, a trans mindset, because there's a lot of shit there. Yeah. It, 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 there's even... There's even specific lines that, like, call it out, like, I am Trinity. Really? Are you surprised? Yeah, I thought you were a, I thought you were, you would be a man. Well, yeah, most men think that. Hmm. You know? Like, okay, there you go. That's some trans shit. Yeah. It was, it was weird for me to have watched The Matrix my entire life, and then two weeks ago, me put on my my chest and put makeup on and do my hair up and get dressed in my best female outfit and to have Mei Lin go out to the movies and watch The Matrix because a lot of it was just like, ooh, I am noticing things. This must have been what everyone was talking about. Okay, then. But when I watch The Matrix, I'm like, oh, a new Matrix film. This is going to be great. Okay, it's just a sequel. All right, then. It, it felt like The Matrix 3 revisited, you know? And it's yeah. like, okay, that's a little bit disappointing, but whatever. And finally, the Steve Stubbs movie pick of the week is Gizmo Del Toro's new film, Nightmare Alley. I call him, I, I, I want to call him Gizmo Del Toro because there is, it, Guillermo Del Toro is famous, but in my mind, there's only yeah. one Guillermo, and the vampires call him Gizmo. Yeah. So I'd like to, from now on, call this director Gizmo del Toro, because that uh, makes I, sense. I, I, th- I think it's a term of respect. Yeah, I think so, too. Gizmo del Toro's new film, Nightmare Alley. Because in- the other Gizmo is cool as fuck. Cool as shit. Cool as shit. And he's gay in real life. I'm hoping that eventually he, his character comes out as gay in the TV show, What We Do in the Shadows. But until that happens, I'm just fine with him being the, like, Mr. Smithers to his vampire C. Montgomery Burns. I, I, feel, I feel toward him the exact same way I felt toward Willow on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Nice. Like, okay. like, it's not like a sexual thing. Like, in both, I just want to hug them and be really, really nice to them. You know? Yeah. That's it. That's. I, I, I just want to. I just want to be really kind to them because they both yeah. look like they really just need it. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I get that. Uh. So I, I, would, I would call it a compliment, calling him Gizmo, but good Christ, does it ever drip Oscar bait? What, Nightmare Alley? Yeah, just from the previews and shit oh, I've seen. Oh, okay. Really, I'm, like, I'm like immediately turned off by its Oscar-ness. Okay, well, let me tell you. Let me tell you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you back. It's an old-time Carney sideshow movie. Yeah. It it is. It, they don't show a lot of the carny shit, but I'd say about half of this film is in carnivals and sideshows, traveling uh, carnivals and freak shows and geeks and you know riding the rails, you know going on trains and going from small town to small town and hard drinking and here's a strong man and here's the midget and here are all these carny workers and here are all of these like like con men and hustlers, and, and a lot of it feels like Todd Browning's freaks, and the ending yeah. is 
kind of, sort of, in a way, freaks related. And it's, it's just an extremely well done, old timey, carny sideshow crime noir. And it's really great. And I really love it. But sadly, it came out the same day as Spider Man, No More Spider Man, All the Spider Men, Spider Men. Yes. And, and, and so. Everyone is seeing Andrew, I hate Mondays and love lasagna, lie about not being in the movie. A everyone's going to see the new Spider-Man, and no one is going to see Gizmo's new movie. And it's just sad, because this is a really good and well-done, captivating, carny noir film. And it's really great, and I love it. And it's about... This guy, and he has this mysterious past that you eventually learn about. He's trying, you don't know who he is. He's like hiding his identity, and he's riding the rails, going from town to town, looking for a, you know, a way to start fresh. And he sees a carnival, and he gets a job there, and he, he tries to reinvent himself, and eventually he comes under the tutelage of this fake uh, psychic that's just hustling people as one of the sideshow acts. Yeah. And one of the rules is, like, n never do a spook show. What you're doing is, you're, you're getting some money, tricking people, having a fun time, doing fake uh, uh, psychic readings. Don't lie to people. Don't, don't say, hey, your, your dead mother is here, and her hand is on your shoulder, and I'm going to tell you this. That's a spook show. That is horrible. And it's one thing to be like a carny act in the a sideshow act in the traveling carnival. It's another thing to do a spook show and never do a spook show. But uh, what's his name? Um, uh, Bradley Cooper. He starts doing spook shows, and the last, like, 15, 20 minutes of the film are just balls out insane. But it, it, it's, a, it's carny noir, and it's really, really good. But sadly, Spider-Man did the film in, because this has a huge budget, $60 million. Some big names are in it, but it has only made $4 million at the box office. On a budget of $60 million, no one is going to see this. So yeah, it does look like Oscar bait, and it's going to be nominated for a few Oscars. Maybe Bradley Cooper will be nominated for something. Kate Blanchett's in it, and she does a great job. She'll be nominated for something. Maybe a Best Supporting Actor will go to the Green Goblin, who's in both films. Good for him. Yeah. But um, if this film was released pre-pandemic, it would have been great. <coughs> if this film was released any time besides right next to Spider-Man, it would have done great, and I think it would have been more of a hit. But sadly, Spider-Man did it in. I saw the, the movie came out on Friday. I saw it on Monday. Yeah, no but, one was at the theater. Why do you fucking open a movie against Spider-Man? Why? Know, I don't know. I, I, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas opened the same day as... Matthew Broderick's Godzilla. Yeah. And that was Terry Gilliam's idea. And his idea was, you don't want to be seen leaving the theater for Godzilla, but you will want to be seen leaving the theater for a Hunter S. Thompson movie. And it's like, okay, I get that, and I understand that, but also, if you know everyone's going to see this movie... I understand you thinking I'm going to be counter-programming, but yeah. that's just going to fuck up your budget. That's going to fuck up your box office gross. So it's a really good movie, and, and, and I, I might put it on my top ten list, I just, but I also feel sad for it because, like, oh, you, you done got fucked by the spider. Peter yes. Parker done fucked you up. You know? Yeah, I... Yeah, I there's a world of difference between Godzilla and Spider-Man. Matthew Broderick's Godzilla, let me preface. Yeah, Matthew Broderick. Yes. Matthew Broderick. It's like Frankenstein. Matthew Broderick. But, but yeah, like, Spider-Man fucked this movie up. It is a great movie. 
and I really like it. But ain't no one going to see Gizmo's new movie, and that's a damn shame. That yeah. is a damn. So uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll give it another. It, uh, it's just it's the Oscar Beatty shape of water, Pan's Labyrinth, Guillermo del Toro that I'm not particularly in love with. But I can't stress enough how much of a carny film this is. Yeah. You know, a, you know, it feels. It, sometimes it feels like a modern day, like not a modern day freaks, but in that world, you know, yeah. of just, you know, these carnies and they all know each other and they all are a family, but also they can't trust each other because they're all kind of fucking bastards. You know, yes. a lot of people with drinking problems and with drug problems and, and uh, oh, yeah, here's how you get a geek to bite the heads off of chicken. Here's how we trick people into doing it. Here's the, here's the underbelly. Here's the drugs. Here's how you con a sucker. Here's how you find a mark. Here's how you read, you know, idiots. And it, it, so much of it is just that you can smell the carny that, that they're in, you know? Yeah. And it's just so good. But the movie just shows, like, Oscar Beatty stuff, but it, you can tell that Guillermo del Toro, you know, knows his carny freak show, carnival barker type shit, and it's, it's really fucking fun. Yeah. It's a fun-ass movie. But Spider-Man fucked it. The Matrix will, fucked will it. I have to, will I have to watch Santa Santa Gray to understand it? Huh? <laughs> will I have to watch Santa Santa Gray? To understand it? Oh, no, not at all. Not at all. It takes a while to understand what you're watching because it really just throws you into the deep end of like, here's this guy. Who, who is he? You have no idea. What's his name? Not telling you. What did he do? You have no clue. Watch him struggle for 15 minutes. And I'm like, wait, who the fuck even is this person? So it takes a while for you to get your footing but yeah. once you get to the carnival, it's just like, oh, God, this is great. This is fun. I love it. You know? A, a wonderful film. Really love it. It well, might make my top ten list. I'll put it on my will see list. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm hurt. I'm bitter. I, I'm big enough to admit that. Okay? Yeah. We'll right. see. Yeah. So that's it for Steve Stubbs this week. Next week, I have no idea what I'm watching. Uh, something. But uh, that'll be next week. So join us next week for more up-to-date movie reviews with Steve Stubbs of the Week. <laughs>